KCRW sponsors include A24, presenting Moonlight, a film chronicling three chapters in the life of a young black man, discovering his identity and experiencing first love as he moves from childhood into manhood. In theaters now. On To The Point, we try to make sense of the policy debates and the political sideshows on the campaign trail. Neither party's agenda really aligns with who its coalition is today. It was the dumbest speech I have ever seen in my life of covering politics. When people walk into a voting booth, at the end of the day, they do say, I really should vote for someone smarter than me. I'm Warren Olney. To The Point has you covered for the 2016 campaign. Find the To The Point podcast on KCRW's iTunes page. From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, it's The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. I'm Elvis Mitchell. It started off as an Esquire magazine supplement, Gentlemen's Quarterly, because it was actually a quarterly supplement. And then the good folks at Condé Mast bought it. Uh, when did Condé Mast buy it, Jeff? 1982. And it went from being a part of Esquire to a magazine that has uh, actually, I think, gone a long way to sort of define style versus fashion, which is a crucial difference, especially for men. My guest is its editor-in-chief, Jim Nelson, who's been there since, in this position since 2003. That's right. But when I first met you, you told me you'd had a different life before GQ. I had a couple different lives. I started out after college. I started out working in news, That's in broadcast news. Yeah, yeah. My my grandfather had been a White House photographer from Roosevelt to Reagan. I grew up in D.C. and I just loved that world. I just thought that's where I'm going to go. My uncle too was a the first CNN White House producer back when it was still called you know Chicken Noodle Net News. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so and it was I was only, like, and it was only in various hotels. Nobody exactly, had it at their house. Exactly. I was so into that. I thought that was going to be what I was going to do. And I did an internship in college and then started there right out of college and wrote news and produced and field produced and you know did stakeouts outside Capitol Hill. And I liked it, especially the writing part, especially understanding, as you understand with radio, that writing for you know news is really aural. It's very much an ear thing. And I enjoyed that. Um, but after about three or four years of doing just news, I thought, this is just not enough. It's not creative enough. I always felt like I had to tell the story of Algeria in 25 seconds, you know, and no one gets anything good out of that, including Algeria. And, and so I just was like, I, I, got, I want to I wanna be, work more creatively. And so I took that nebulous idea to Hollywood, which you should never take nebulous ideas to. And I decided I was going to be a writer in Hollywood. So I spent my 20s living in L.A. And, and you actually reported on this for the magazine. I wrote about this, yes. I, 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 had, <laughs> I called it the horrible bosses of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I did not, let's say I did not like my bosses. And, you know, when you're in, when you're in Hollywood, dogs are actually treated better than, than assistants. Um, and I was working on sitcoms and trying to be a, a writer's assistant, trying to, to make it as a writer. But what I did like about it is actually what I ended up liking about magazines once I realized that's what I should do, is that it's a very, you know, TV at its best is a very is a collaborative effort. And what I didn't like when I was working on network sitcoms, and this was, you know, 20 years ago, was that it was, you know, you start out with an idea and then you get the notes from the network and you get the notes from the studio and you get the notes from the executive producer and then you change everything, including the essence of the characters. And I thought, this is just stupid. Now, of course, TV is vastly different now and they have auteurs and, you know, people are allowed to actually do what they want. But at that point, I thought, you know, I was 30 years old and I had... I was a, I just a fanatic for Harper's Magazine, you know, Lewis Lapham's Harper's Magazine. I was just – for all of them, New Yorker, Atlantic, I just devoured them. And especially living in L.A., that was just, a, you know, an oasis of intellectual <laughs> thought. You know, I was like, oh, I can't wait till my Harper's comes in the mail. And I, through, through some friends who actually, funnily enough, were working for Fred Friendly in radio, they knew – uh, these Harper's guys, and, and they Fred were Friendly is the legendary CBS News president who brought in Edward R. Murrow and these guys who brought a kind of probably the kind of storytelling that went through news that made you want to do it in the first place. Exactly, exactly. And they knew these guys from Harper's: Paul Tuff, Jack Hitt, Michael Pollan. And Jack and Paul came to L.A. one day, and I told my friends, and I said, I was like the biggest Harper's junkie. It was like it was bigger than Brad Pitt coming to L.A. <laughs> and I was like, I have to meet them. I have to meet these editors. Is that combination Harper's. of sort of Eastern intellectualism and Southern gentility? Because yes. 
because it was it's a very specific kind of sensibility of Harper's as compared to the Atlantic or the New Yorker. I think it also Harper's has a naturalist. You know, they they have a, they love the West. They they love to publish Western writers, Edward Hoagland, that kind of thing. But I also thought they were very very provocative. I think in the in the early 90s, they were the best magazine in America. They had so many smart people there besides Paul and Jack Hitt, Michael Pollan, and, and of course, Lewis Lapham, uh, Elena Silverman, who's now at the New York Times Magazine. These were all people that sort of mentored me. And, you know, I did an internship. I, I got to meet them. I did an internship. I was just mad for it. I just loved it. As soon as I did it, I was like, okay, this is actually the combination of all these, these two things that I love, news, journalism, and, and entertainment. And so I started working for Harper's. What really what Tom Wolfe called creative nonfiction. Exactly, exactly. In fact, when when I was there, Tom Wolfe published, you know, this the the biggest essay Harper's ever ran, uh, which was about stalking the ten thousand legged beast. Yes, yes. And David Foster Wallace worked back then. He did the cruise ship piece, the uh, state fair piece. Those were Colin Harrison working there. It's just it's still you know I think there's it, it encourages it, it's a magnet for a lot of really. Uh, innovative thinkers, you know, John Jeremiah Sullivan, who ended up writing stuff for us, came out of there, Joel Lovell, all these people that I just think it it encouraged. It was it was a communal thing. People there would say, Harper's really isn't a magazine. It's a community. It's like, no, it's still a magazine. It's got to come out every month. <laughs> and I was really drawn in particular to the reading section, which if you look at it now, back when I think about it, it was pretty much pre-internet then. This is 90. Uh, 93. 94, yeah. yeah. I, was there, I was there from 93 to 97. And it was, you know, the reading section in a sense was a precursor to what the web does so well. And I think has challenged probably the reading section, but it, it was a compendium. It was a digest, almost like a highbrow reader's digest. And I ended up working on that, and that's then ultimately, but that's a, that, unlike the internet, it's, that stuff was very edited. Though I mean, you had, oh, you, yes. had, you had a sense of cohesion in the way yes. that it was like putting together the best of, you know, uh, thought. You you could you were, do, you were doing a mini magazine. I got to edit that section, and nothing could have. I just couldn't imagine how happy I was that I, that I was doing this thing, and I could pick the art. I'd go to galleries and pick the art and the reading section at Harper's. I would, you know, I would do annotations. I would do fiction. I would. This could help. You know, discover new talent and publish them. People that were in like maybe sometimes small journals because that was mostly reprinting and trying to find government documents, original government documents. It makes you a really good reporter and researcher. One of the things that that uh, people don't realize, and it's why so many people come out of that internship, is that Harper's makes you. They just basically give you the Harper's index when you're on your first day at the internship, and they say. You have to prove the existence of God, you know, <laughs> with, through primary sourcing, and and, and, and with the statistical uh, data to sort of show how where this comes from. Yeah, they just <laughs> they just say the percentage of rank is you know is this you know the GDP of uh, African African countries versus McDonald's is what, and then you have to do that. You have to prove it. You have to get uh, ultimate sources, and they also like just they it's it's such a collective uh, you know hive of great thinking that goes into one page. It was amazing. Cheris Khan was the editor of that. And it just, I was so inspired by the rigor that went into, into that, you know, they, and, and they never pretty much never had to change anything, correct anything. Cause it was just so rigorous. So you learn really quickly how to become a great reporter. You just have to get on the phone. Don't be afraid to get on the phone and call people. And you'll find that people are actually surprised that reporters are, or a little young urchin interns like myself <laughs> Are are actually calling to to you know to check and find the information on primary sourcing, and then you grow from there and you and you do you know you get to I started being able to publish fiction there and and publish nonfiction, and then my mentor there Elena Silverman went to GQ and at first I didn't really read GQ, when I I remember being a kid and seeing Cary Grant on the cover of GQ I don't know if you remember this this was. Would have been in the in the eighties. He was eighty five years old. Sure, he's smiling with the the, the lines of the suit matching the hair. It is the coolest cover. It's still just about the coolest cover. And the of silver tie. I mean, yes, it's, yes. And I remember that you don't, you wanna, you don't want to quiz me. I know. I don't want to go head to toe with you. <laughs> But it, it, it was that one. It was also the Richard Gere cover. Do you remember that one? I do remember that. That um, one that this would imitate the American Gigolo poster. Exactly. Exactly. With, you know, styling by Giorgio Armani. And he, actually, when you look at it, he's smoking a cigarette. Those are my two favorite iconic GQ covers. And those were what I kind of knew about GQ. I would look at it, pick it up. 
but I had a memory of it from you know grade school, and I didn't really know it that well. Just from supermarket seeing and seeing that character. Were you an Esquire reader in those days? No, I was a Mad Magazine and Rolling Stone reader <laughs> during those days. Come on, come on. I wasn't that sophisticated. But I was really I was a I was a hardcore. I went through phases. I as a kid, I was just like mad, sick, crazy. All those all these magazines you talk about, Mad and Rolling Stone and yeah. and 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 Harper's and magazines. That you talk about the community. Yeah, there was a sense of community in those magazines. Absolutely. I mean, you knew the usual cast of idiots from Mad Magazine, and there was this kind of communal writing where people in Charles M. Young and those guys was write about what it was like to chase this story down bef- and what Jan said to them before the piece went into the magazine. So that idea that conversation is something you want to get in some way, wasn't I, it? I always had a sense, a feeling of community when I looked at magazines. I remember when I was a kid, my mom said, my mom and dad said, we're going to New York. And I said, I want to go to the offices of Mad Magazine and visit publisher William M. Gaines. <laughs> And my dad was like, if that's what you want. And did you go? I, we, we didn't get to, to visit. They, I think they wouldn't let us upstairs. <laughs> I actually think that Mad Magazine does, deserves more credit. It was incredibly influential on the sense of satire of a generation. And you think about the, the Saturday Night Live and all this, all that culture came from, a, it was really subversive, especially because kids bought it in, you know, like I did in a tobacco shop when I was a kid, a magazine shop. And it was subversive. And then Rolling Stone spoke to you back then in the 70s and 80s as just being on the cusp of it. You know, I always loved when Rolling Stone came in and it was on paper and it sure. was the photography and When it was Annie the bigger, they all, they all the Annie Leibovitz shots. By the way, it's the treatment. We're talking about the history of Jim Nelson with Jim Nelson, who was editor of GQ. Thank you. No, no, please. Well, I, I actually, that, that's my idea. Jan Winter can take this and then he can pay me later. But if I were Rolling Stone, what I would do is I would return to the era of paper. I would return to a sort of like big tabloid edition. It would be so cool because what that does, when they went to and, and, and became kind of like a supermarket glossy, that wasn't rock and roll. It wasn't Rolling Stone. But by that point, it was a magazine, as somebody who worked there, I can tell you, it hadn't been rock and roll for a yeah, long time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you remember what it was like to get your copy and you were like, and it's, and it's John Lennon and Yoko Ono on naked in bed. And since then, like I still go, I'll go to flea markets and buy old copies of 1950s Fortune. And I still get inspired by those things because they're a treasure trove. They're, they're beautifully designed. I mean, the Rolling Stones, I just, I just saw one the other day that had like, you know, an interview with William Holden. And it was the most badass interview I've ever read. It was like 43,000 words. First of all, they spend weeks with these people. I, I, yeah. I found out about Philip K. Dick through a, a Rolling Stone interview that made me go out and read The Man in the High Castle. Totally, I yeah. Mean, and you got a sense of this guy as being this functioning, paranoid, schizophrenic, bipolar person who dropped acid and threw the I Ching to write and still function. I mean, that that kind of access. See... Let's talk about this because these kinds of things you're talking about gave us a window into these people, both the subject and the writer. Yes. And there was something that I do credit that era of, of kind of gonzo, go for it, and, and the audience will go with you if you engage them and you send a great writer somewhere on a great subject. And that has always inspired me. It's why I wanted to send John Jeremiah Sullivan to a Christian rock festival, which you know ended up – getting a National Magazine Award nomination because it was just, it was a crazy idea. And, you know, it's some of these ideas, you have to gamble sometimes because you're not sure if they're actually going to work out. With someone whose mind is as big as John Jeremiah Sullivan, it's probably going to work out. And you got to trust the great writers to do that. But I, I was always inspired by that and always thought that there was a way to unleash the next generation of talent. Next, you know, like I think Chris Heath is one of those writers who... You know, he he won a National Magazine Award a couple of years ago for doing this piece on the um, on the Zaneland, Ohio Zoo escape, the animals that escaped, and that guy just just thought, okay, I'm going to make this the most definitive story of you know American animal craziness that ever was, and he just digs all these feature writers when they're really good reporters. And you give that that you know the gracefulness of of knowing how to write a sentence, and you combine that with great reporting, it'll just knock your socks off. I think an example of that, a recent example of that piece on the on how Atlanta strip clubs influence hip hop. Yes, I mean it really is that thing that for those of us who knew that world and was hoping that secret would never get out. <laughs> yeah, Magic City. That's the one Devin Friedman wrote. Yeah, and it's true. It's one of those things where 
you know, in, in, in some ways it's sitting right in front of your face and some magazines or some people might just want to do a photo essay and that's fine. It's, it's, it's titillating. It's funny. But what Devin did was try to explain that that is actually so influential on the music industry because DJs come to this, this Atlanta strip club and they get to play their records and, th and actually the strippers have an inordinate amount of power, power. Yeah. in which music they want to play and dance to and these guys all come out and try their stuff out there and Atlanta is the sort of capital of hip-hop. It's I, I so th exciting. I think that this thing you're talking about is this thing that because they've been under the Art Cooper incarnation yeah. of GQ, kind of a clubbiness, yeah. whether if you, either you belong, and if you don't, we don't care. Right. I mean, there was a kind of elitism, which is interesting coming from a guy who worked at Penthouse. <laughs> yeah, he was the editor of Penthouse before editor of GQ. Yeah, so when I came on, I, was, I worked for Art Cooper. He was, in a way, the last of an era of swaggering madmen era, uh, you know, cigar in the, in the office, whiskey at 5 o'clock, Art Cooper would, would, would leave every day at 11.55 and head to the Four Seasons. There would be a martini waiting for him at the table. And sometimes he'd invite you to go along, and that would be great fun. And also, you would never be able to get another drop of work done that day. <laughs> and, he would, and he would do two martinis, three martinis. You'd have wine, because he got there at 5. You know, he got there at 5.30 and, you know, and, and did all his work before 11.55. And then it was just drinking. Then, he'd, you know, then he'd, come, he'd come back to the office, and he'd make all the phone calls to publicists that he, he was too afraid to make when he was <laughs> sober. <laughs> <laughs> But, 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 but he, did, he did love long-form journalism, and he actually brought that to Penthouse, to give him credit. He, he, brought, he got Philip Roth to Oh, no, there's, there are the big investigative pieces there, because I mean, yeah. he, he, he wanted to compete with what Playboy is doing, yep. which, but also without that kind of sense of condescension, he didn't want the pieces to feel like they were gifts to you. Exactly. And, 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 but still, after a while, there got to be this kind of sort of apropos of Mad Men, yep. this kind of oak clubby sort of place that certain kinds of people didn't fit in. Yeah, I think what he did that is truly influential and that it still sticks around, what Art Cooper did was bring in a general interest magazine with Esquire in mind as well, but with a more of a fashion bent, right? So it was speaking to a certain kind of guy in the 80s. They were, you know, they were Lakers fans and they were, you know, they were, you know, big, I call them big swinging dicks. I don't know if I can say that on NPR. You just did. But uh, <laughs> they were... Um, Big swinging guys. And who, no, no, and half of them didn't know what GQ was. Yes. I mean, at some point you see Kevin Costner, what is this magazine anyway? In, yeah. And that was the thing. It didn't matter as long as they, I'm sure they thought it was like guys quipping or something. They, but, but, but he did make it a mass magazine and, you know, everyone who was everyone, Jack Nicholson, you know, all those guys were on the cover of GQ and he made it big. And by the time I came on, you know, it was... Maybe it was, as you say, a little clubby. It was. It felt a little martini set. And this was before Mad Men made that nostalgic again, right? And I remember feeling like, I don't know if I'm going to fit in. You know, on my first interview, he offered me a drink. Uh, it was just, yeah. I mean, and I was like, I don't think I want to get drunk on my interview. And he offered, ended up offering me the job right then and there just because he liked, we got along, you know. And, but he was, yeah, it was a kind of boozy era but he definitely had ambitions for, for GQ being a, a house of great writers. He had Alan Richmond writing about food, you know. Who's still there. Tom Junot and I was at Esquire, you know. Did, yeah, he takes some of those guys. That great some, stuff. Yeah. yeah, really, really great stuff. And so I was honored to work there. But when I worked there for a while, I thought, you know, the era is changing. The, the world is changing. People's attention spans are changing. You can't just run, you know. 27,000 word pieces in a row <laughs> and then have a fashion story <laughs> and you need to do some service and you need to reach, reach the modern man. One of the things I said to him actually was or said when I got the job I, as I was pitching myself to get the job and I never thought I would get the job by the way. I thought I thought I wouldn't get, no I thought that they'd give it to somebody that was you know uh, maybe a little bit more experienced. I, I had never been an editor-in-chief I figured they'd bring in someone new and fire us all. And I just bought a, a house in the country and I knew I was going to get fired. <laughs> but what I told them was one of the things you need to do is update nostalgia. This nostalgia was stuck in a certain era. It was very Rat Pack, Dean Martin, you know, and I just, it just didn't speak to my generation. And you needed to 
update that to, you know, maybe it's maybe at that point, maybe now nostalgia's Kurt Cobain, which is who's, by the way, newly influential in fashion. Oh, yes. Yes. yes you totally see that. I, I've, look seen, I've, I've, seen, I've seen I've seen that look coming back. And also the other thing is that 90s stuff is actually now. Totally. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you saw what Jaden Smith was wearing in our magazine recently, but it's all kind of a trippy. It's somewhere between hippie 60s Jimi Hendrix and, you know, kind of what Kurt Cobain was wearing, which was basically the vintage version of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. What he yeah, could buy in secondhand shops. Stuff that he could do. And that, yeah. Actually, I want to talk to you a little bit about vintage because I think that becomes a way that the magazine's been really influential. The, there's a kind of a feel of vintage that's sort of at the foundation of the, of the look of the magazine. We'll take a break. My guest is Jim Nelson. He's editor-in-chief of GQ. It's The Treatments. The more to come, stay with us. Listen to KCRW's 24-hour all-news channel. Stream BBC World Service, NPR, and KCRW programs. Continuous coverage on our mobile app or online at kcrw.com. Welcome back. It's a treatment. I'm talking to Jim Nelson, who's going on 15 years at GQ now. Going on 13 years. Don't. No, I can't. That's don't not lucky. Age me. That's not. <laughs> you know, it's in the. It's, it's, okay. it's, it's within. Ahead. It's within reach. All right. I'm sorry. I'm just. You know, I'm just trying to show off my casual wear here. I'm That's sitting. awesome. <laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> but I, I think, though, one of the things that the, the magazine has done, just in terms of a sensibility, and you were talking about that, is that idea that not forcing nostalgia was something that you find. And, and there was a, a kind of a seriousness of intent in that previous version of GQ. But it, it, it basically it coalesced a vision that hadn't existed really in GQ before in terms of editorial terms. I mean, there was certainly a style uh, point of view, but the, the, before art, there wasn't an editorial point of view in the magazine. And what you choose to do, what you choose to do with it is basically sort of make it more inviting rather than forcing it down, making it less tough, I think. But also that sense of yearning, I think, is in so much of the magazine. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because one of the things that I think people sometimes malign fashion by is by saying that it's superficial and it's you not know, you know yeah some people say that and but I it's, think it's it's I think it's it's, it's 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 storytelling it's narrative in the communal way that that these magazines that you talk about and I think that style and is very personal very meaningful to people and that fashion is serious I think actually you can have both those things you can have great journalism and you can care about the way you look in the world who doesn't I think Europeans have a little less hangups than Americans do about that. You know, for me, you know, the sense of vintage, you're talking about vintage. Guys like you, you and I, we, we tend to buy something and just wear the hell out of it and, and love the story of it, where it came from, where we bought it from. And the way we incorporate it into our wardrobe is actually meaningful. Maybe we actually discard some stuff along the way and, and embrace something new. We're always kind of evolving and changing. And I think that's really meaningful to people. And the way I said was when I came on was, Let's just make GQ more of a guidebook for those guys, an inspiration book, a manual. I call it the front section manual. Tr try to demystify it. I think, that, I think that men and women do read magazines differently. I think, I think women um, are actually more promiscuous <laughs> with their magazines. They read, they read their magazines. They read a ton of magazines, and it's, this is a great thing. I think it's great. In some ways, I wish men were a little bit more like this, but they read a ton of magazines, and they get inspired loosely by everything they see. And I think men are a little more literal and a little more loyal in their readership. You know, they read well, it's, things. It's, they're looking for a club to belong to. Yes. And I also think the, 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 the real difference is finally men, to some extent, want to be told what to wear. Yes. They do. They want to, at, le at least they want to, to know. I would say GQ teaches you what the rules are and then the confidence to know how to break them. And I think that is actually the – if, if I'm, I glad, just, I'm glad I heard you say that because there's, there's so much about this that people are intimidated by yep. and, and they're slavish to. Once, Whenever I hear somebody say, I wear nothing but, I say, what's wrong with you? Why would you do that to yourself? Yeah, then you're just wearing costumery. And the people who have true style, they'll blend in some, you know, vintage shirt that they've had for 15 years with a, you know, a brand new Saint Laurent leather jacket and feel like a million bucks because it's, it's, it feels like them. Talking about anybody we know? My guess yeah. is Jim Nelson who's basically wearing the outfit he just described. <laughs> He's the editor-in-chief of GQ. But I think that idea of style appends to everything. Mm -hmm. and, and it's – you talking about yeah. – I mean, for me, I can't think of anybody who has bigger influence on me than Derrida who was in – you, some could call him vain. I call him a very stylish man who mm -hmm. took a lot of care in the way he put himself together and the way he also assembled ideas. 
And, and that's, I think that's what you want the magazine to be. That same kind of care applies to every area of your life. I want it to be lifestyle. I want it to be aspirational. But I also want it to be you know, attainable because I think sometimes some magazines make it look like it's just – you know, you, you've seen that sometimes where, where fashion can seem like it's it's just above you, unreachable. And what I always thought was there was a way to bridge that gap and to make it seem like, you know, to demystify some of it. Because I do think men are different and men do read magazines. They want a, they want a kind of manual on how to dress. And, and they want – they don't actually always want 50 denim shirts <laughs> to choose from. They want to know the one <laughs> coolest shirt – to wear. And sometimes what we, we do is, you know, tell people to diversify, like, you know, 50 ways to wear one suit differently. And that somehow breaks through the, the reader's mind because they realize they don't have to go out and they don't have to, like, chase every single trend. They can actually what – we're, what, we're, what we are here to do is to help them figure out what their own sense of style can be and, and to liberate them from – too rigid thinking and to give them, you know, some some aspiration. Well, it comes out of a party I was famously not invited to recently. The Man <laughs> of the Year issue. I'm his... never going to live that one down. You. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, what you've done with the Man of the Year now yeah. is that it's it's several different covers. So you get a chance to see how this – but that's also something that you do throughout the year as well. Yes. On several occasions where it's – a different guy with a different kind of style or a different representation of style on the cover. So people – I think you've done this in a really interesting subtle way to say that style is not monolithic. Yep. Well, the split cover thing began as we started doing something called the Style Bible. And at first I was worried that I was going to get struck dead by God when I called it the Style Bible. But well, I guess we know where you're from. Yeah, yeah, Catholic. <laughs> I, I never leaves you. Um, <laughs> but uh, when we did the Style Bible, we were like, hmm, you know what's – this was Fred Woodward, our design director, who is also speaking of legends. I get to work with some of the greatest legends. Jim Moore, creative director, who I know was on here, and Fred Woodward, our design director, who had been in the 70s and 80s uh, – or in the 80s of – the, the classic era of of Rolling Stone into the 90s, um, and I just uh, I just so respect his energy and visual. Just his, both these guys, Jim Moore and Fred Woodward, they they never stop being inspired by new artists, new designers, new photographers. It's so inspiring, and you know. With, but also they give them a context too, so they so we know where they from whence they come. Yes, exactly. And you know, I remember Fred told me that when he was at Rolling Stone, he did. Crosby, Stills, and Nash, or maybe it was Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and you had to – it was just pictures, and you had to turn the page and see Crosby, Stills, Nash, <laughs> you know, you keep moving along. And I was like, that is so badass. That's so bold. I love that kind of a thing. And I remember being on the receiving end of that and being inspired by it. You know, I think that's, that's so great. But Fred was the one who said, if you want to do the Style Bible and you kind of want to break out – the reason why I wanted to do it, I should begin by saying, is that I wanted – we're in a new era where stars and celebrities aren't minted as easily as they used to be. It's not like there's a Jack Nicholson on the cover every month. And Hollywood is pretty much creating robots and animated characters and a lot of you know team players and not great superstars. And so there aren't as many. And curiously, TV and the digital age has affected that as well. There's just – you know everything's been democratized in some ways. But that means there's not as many – superstars being minted all the time. So we were we were thinking about it and we're thinking about how in a weird way style itself has been on a huge trajectory. It's become the major player. It's what all these actors they want to go on the red carpet at men of the year and they want to you know they want to be on Instagram and they they have to hire stylists because style's bigger than they are. And we thought how can we do that and show it? And that's where we, we blew up the GQ logo and did split covers with a bunch of guys that we loved but who may not really – wouldn't maybe carry a cover on their own or maybe – or maybe might but just would be – would feel stronger with this kind of style message behind them. And when we started doing that, it really resonated with our readers. They just – you know, we had John Slattery. You know, I would put him on the cover now but, you know, at that point he was – on Mad Men, he was second to John Hamm, you know. And, we did him with a couple others. We put basketball players on there, where you know, which is a huge fount of, uh, of style these days. It's amazing, and, and amazing. the magazine's actually been sort of following that over the years as 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 has happened. Yes, and 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 have tried to push and nurture that that scene because it's it's something that you know it's a way that American style really influences global style. But I feel like basketball players. That's one of the things that 
that Esquire and the old GQ had in common is that they understood that basketball players going back to the New York Knicks yeah. of Walt Frazier. Yeah. Uh, those and guys were those guys who really brought a certain they, – they had the kind of confidence in themselves where they made style seem like a masculine kind of bearing rather than something that provoked questions about what you were. Yeah, or I remember you know the 1980s era, Michael Jordan on the cover – numerous time he was just bigger than anyone first time with hair yes like, <laughs> yes i love that one i love that one uh and then with men of the year we just decided to turn it into something that celebrated the totality of achievement and you know we had, we had an interview with president obama this year um bill simmons did uh a, a radio great like you and we did and we had uh and we had um tom brady declaring him the greatest quarterback of all time, which I think is probably correct. That's certainly controversial. <laughs> controversial, yeah, but just stick with us. Um, uh, and, and, is this and where Purgatorio comes into play now? Yes, it is. the Bible and St. Tom Brady's the greatest of all time, we know where you're going. Yes, St. Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that's a mix where we could, we, we also expanded the size of the issue. And that's another thing that I believe kind of in the future for magazines. I think that, you know, we're all going to become more and more digital and you know, more social mediated and that's great. And our, you know, our website has grown in the last year from 5 million to 11 million. There's a lot of hunger for style coverage and the kind of writing we do and journalism we do. And then the style section of the website, you're constantly putting stuff up. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's a, it's a way to sort of update and have things that wouldn't go into the magazine, isn't it? Yeah. And, and in one sense, it's the only growth category out there. It's like, we're, we're, we're doing GQ style. It was, a, it began as a little supplement. And now just like GQ quarterly, G gentlemen's quarterly grew out of Esquire. GQ style is now going to be its own standalone quarterly. Um, oh, really? Yes, starting in, in next year, 2016. And we're going to announce an editor next week. It's wow. very exciting. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's a growing thing. And what I'm saying is that as digital grows, what I think magazines need to do is make print printier. Because actually print is a luxury. Print can actually feel like an immersive tactile experience unlike any other. And so when I, I've been making the magazine wider and bigger and actually investing in paper stock and investing going to, in the experience. And going back to the size of the old GQ or the yeah. old Rolling Stone, because GQ was also a big magazine too, the individual iteration the way Esquire was. Exactly. And to make people feel like, did my hands just get tiny? When you know, when they're going through the magazine, make it feel big. And I think that's, that is really exciting to me to imagine, you know, these, these, this future where, you know, you've got extreme digital growth, video, you've got, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and you're all growing that. At, at that men of your party, we just had, we had a Snapchat geotag around the entire Chateau Marmont. And that our, you know, the feed we did had 67 million viewers. I mean, so in a way, you're reaching more people than ever. Um, and so I think you should contradistinguish them and make the print version just like a true luxury object. And, and, and you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of art. It should be. It should be something that you want to have in your house and keep around. That's, what, that's the other thing. But you're talking about sense of community. I always think that a magazine – needs to live with you. It needs to, you know, you want to you wanna have two and three and four visits with. I want people to, you know, proudly leave that around and maybe read the first story, the beginning of another, and then come back to it because it's so good they can't put it down. People tell me all the time, GQ is my favorite magazine. And that is the happiest news I've ever heard. I just, it makes me so happy because I know what my favorite magazines were growing up. And, you know, to hear that, to hear, and I, and I know it's sincere because people will come up to me and just cite every story from the last, the last 12 months. And, and, and some guy said to me recently, he said, GQ helped me become a man. And he said, like, it's, it's like an older brother to me. I, I do think in some ways that's what it can be. It can be sort of an older brother um, or just a, a friend, a helpful guide and vastly entertaining read. No, I mean, I think so much of what the magazine is is – what you get in a sense of the community is information being passed around, yeah. you know? I mean, so it's, it's not this precious thing, but rather something that's offered informally. So it becomes a, an approachable thing to make a part of your life. And, and this thing you're talking about, too, is something that we see so often in European magazines, that sense of size, that sense of scale, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, because there's an understanding. If you're on the train, you can either have something you fold up and you forget about or this, this thing that's been designed, and forgive me for using the Oh, come on, we're curated. Yeah. So it's this 
so it all feels like it's part of a piece and this month's issue relates to last month's issue so it's it's also part of a continuum the challenge is a lot of those European magazines have 12 readers. Exactly. And so you need to, you need to realize that this is a mass magazine and you got to do both. You got to, you got to reach, you know, you, cause, and, and American readers are different than European readers. It's interesting too. I think American readers, they really, the, the, the male readers in particular, you know, I, f I feel like they you really got to hit them at the, at their attention span. You really got to. You got to nail them. I spend a lot of time when I work on stories on getting the lead right, making sure that it's that it reaches into your brain and pulls you into the story immediately. When we do fashion stories, I make sure that there's a theme. You know, you asked me about the difference between the old GQ and new GQ, and I think when I would look at fashion stories in old GQ, and I think even in most fashion magazines, in European fashion magazines. You just see a lot of, you know, gamins, you know, in the field in high grass, you know, looking off into the distance, <laughs> wearing skirts. And I'm like, I can't do that. I've got to reach a mass of American and I got to do it with a sense of style and sophistication. And I got to lead them in a way that makes them want to be a part of that world. And so, so there is a little act of translation and clarity and beautiful photographer that, that that photography is so important and so what i'm saying is you we would do the same thing that we do with journalism is let's if you want to use the word curate but let's be sure that we are messaging the clothes because guys are going to look at this page and they might give you 1.2 seconds if you don't grab them and you got to you, know, you got to hit them with the with with the with a great photograph with a great star subject um, and clarity of style and what the what you know what the trend is or what the um what the look is and sometimes it's sometimes it's more about the personality like you know today i got super excited because we're shooting the rapper young thug in atlanta that'll be another one of those unicorns it's like this guy's so i say, always is, this, is it set well no he, he may not okay. show up okay really is that you think you i'm, I'm okay. saying this now okay. because i know this is airing okay. well, will, and will Lil wayne be sitting on his shoulder yes, <laughs> yes. well Lil wayne was one of those guys for a long time uh, he yes. kept our writer he our, our writer stood outside his bus for just about 24 hours <laughs> and just the, the, the patience of writers, they really are, the patience of writers. I really do, that's why I love writers so much, is that they, they really are passionate people like, you know, or the photographer that has to deal with, you know, sometimes diva tendencies or publicists and agents that aren't maybe all, all working on the same page. And we go in there and we, we do a shoot. We also got to make sure it looks like GQ, right? Jim Moore comes in there, he's got a groomer. He's got like, you know, the racks of clothes, you know, you can try on, on, on a few things, but Jim's got his idea of what is going to make you look be best. And you know what? It is. I was talking to Bradley Cooper at the Men of the Year party. Yeah, I, I saw you. That's but that, but that, I said that cover of Bradley Cooper, which was two years ago, January, was my favorite of the last few years, that and Idris Elba. Because? Because... They were, it's exactly what I was telling you about the Cary Grant cover or the Richard Gere cover. Iconic. You have a great – in both those cases. We actually have – the thing that they have in common with those guys is that they've both been around for a while. Yes. I mean, Jack Nicholson had been around for a while. Uh, <laughs> certainly, Cary Grant had been around for a while. I mean, the, I think what GQ is really wants to get at is not have that sense of evanescence where you feel this mm -hmm. thing is disappearing as you're picking up the magazine. So it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what the clothes are. If you feel like you're looking at somebody who doesn't really matter anymore. I think what you seem to want at GQ, and this even appends to the sport figures or music figures of people who've earned their place into the magazine. Yes. It's, it, it, it isn't just ephemeral. I always love that idea that a GQ will stay on your bookshelf and it will age gracefully and you can pick it up and I actually do I test it all the time I'll go back and look at an uh, at an old GQ and I'll think man we 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 nailed that that still looks like a, it belongs on the shelf and that's when you hit it right like that Bradley Cooper cover was I told him I said I think it's the most iconic shot that we've done in the last couple of years and, and Idris is the other one where it's just like it, it you you have somebody who's just on the cusp who as you say has earned it and you add that GQ Jim Moore style, and you've got a, just a, a, a picture for all time, I think. And, and I think about that. I think when I first started, I remember I had to create a, 
a first cover that was going to have a bang or at least make a declaration. And I thought this has to be new GQ, not old GQ. And I picked Johnny Knoxville. Now, this was 2003. And when I decided to do that, people were just, you know, he's not GQ. And I was like, I know he, he's, the, he's the new GQ. A guy like him can be the new GQ because he, you know, he was young, handsome, actually kind of underappreciated for his sense of style and, and look. And we, I, I still look at that picture, that cover of 2003, and I think that was – that still holds up. That was a declaration of a new – skinny tie, loose, you know, kind of in the air – uh, Johnny's hair looked like a million bucks. And he was a cool guy that I wanted to be. That's what, you, you know, there was an aspirational road path there. Yeah, I mean, these guys who, again, and he'd been around for a while at that yes. point. You know, yes. he, had, he wasn't newly arrived. Yeah. And I feel like that's one of the things that is kind of key with, to what this GQ is, that, that finally gives it a kind of a, a link to the GQ of the past, a GQ that you liked when you saw it, that sense of we're going to be here for a while. We're all going to be here for a while. So we have to follow these people on the roads to see where they get to, but also that they haven't arrived at their final points yet. That is always the debate that we have. What's that? Is, is, is there a moment, right, have they arrived, have they earned it? And there's, there's times when we don't think someone has, even if we're looking at them and liking them and thinking maybe there's a, maybe there's a fashion story for them somewhere, but have they arrived? And in January, the next issue is um, Oscar Isaac from Star Wars, if uh, an a actor I've been following and absolutely love and think is going to be around. I actually think in some funny way he is he – th- he calls back to Pacino. If you look – when you see this cover, you'll see – Well, think, if you see him in a most violent year, he's yeah. dressed like Pacino. No, he, he totally has that iconic 70s style and he's got swagger and confidence, but he's also very elegant. And I think he's a great, great actor. And we just pulled different the people. last year alone between the most violent year, Ex and Machina. Ex Machina, and some other movie that's come out. And I put this he's got. He's also on this um, uh, streaming series too, um, where he's, 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 he's great yeah, in he, it. He's in the the HBO show, the, yeah. the, the, the Paul Haggis uh, show that um, David Simon wrote. And he's in some George Lucasy kind of thing or another at the end yeah. of the year. Who knows what that thing is called? But he's exactly what you're talking about. Somebody that is going to be with us for a while. And, you know, we're a little early on him in some ways, and you know, he's been around, but. People probably don't know who he is, but you know, I, I made sure that the word Star Wars was on the cover. <laughs> oh, that's the thing he's doing, yeah. right? Yeah, that, yeah. that thing, that, that thing, thing, that thing, that thing. But in, in the, the last question, I guess I want to ask you is too. There's also a sense of curiosity about the world. Yeah. In in this, that takes me back to the old. In fact, we, I talked about with Jim Moore when he was here. That sense of going places and wanting to find out what a place looks like. For example, I think about Bobby Cannavale in Cuba. In Cuba, yeah. And 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 but that kind of thing where it's somebody in a place or planting their feet on the ground in those places, and 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 those kinds of spreads also make it feel like it's got that kind of nostalgia for the old GQ, but it's also something that was in that's within reach. I think the magazine has to lead in so many ways, and one of the ways it has to lead is in you know life ambition, aspiration, wanderlust. I'm probably the most wanderlusty guy in, that I've ever <laughs> that I've ever known. I, I will take off uh, tomorrow. So, so you, you got a new adjective out of it. So yes, yeah, wanderlusty. <laughs> I will take off tomorrow for Berlin, and I'll do it on a whim. And I think that I always want to encourage that curiosity in the world, whether it's. You know, whether it's about um, – in, in this next issue, we have the story about uh, Hillsong, you know, what Hillsong Church yeah, is. Sure. And I'm, we're just all curious about it. We want to – we really want to understand what is going on in there. So we just embedded Taffy Ackner, this great writer, talking about a, a writer who's really of hitting her mark right now. Taffy just embedded in that and, you know, got this great story about – Justin Bieber's baptism, which is going to blow people away, and is fair and curious and also keeps her ground as well. And I always think that that whether it's a travel story or a fashion story in Cuba, that you have to lead the way and sometimes show the reader where they don't even know where they want to go next. Is that the thing too? Because finally, again, if we're talking about what the, makes this, this version of GQ different from what preceded, is that, that just going on a whim and finding something. Yes. And being and letting yourself be open to the idea of being surprised. Yes, you know it's funny because when I got the job, whatever it was twelve years ago, thirteen years ago, um, whatever, sign, it was. Almost, whatever it was, almost fifteen, almost fifteen years ago, <laughs> sign Newhouse um, turned out to be incredibly more astute than I even could imagine. And we about, say side Newhouse, side Newhouse, who's the owner, owner of Condé Nast, and 
I w it was my interview time. I'd already been interviewed by the editorial director, James Truman, at the time, who, who, who selected me, and I had to go in for my interview with, with Cy Newhouse. And, you know, he had just all these notes scrolling down. I had written a, I had written a memo, and he had, like, mocked it up and destroyed it and asked me, do you have any idea what you're, what you're going to do? And do, the, do you think about the advertiser? And do you think about this? And I was like, I think about it all. But he said, a magazine has to be a mix of constancy and surprise. I thought that was so profoundly true and has remained true for me that you need constantly to be – you need some constancy. You need, you need you know, stylistic constancy. You need, you know, a sort of a pool of talent, a pool of photographers, a look. But you need to constantly upend that and twist it and surprise it. And that advice has never left me. And we're out of time. I can't believe it's gone this fast. You have to come back. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Well, my pleasure. I guess who will sometimes let me into one of his parties is Jim <laughs> Nelson. He's the editor-in-chief of Gentlemen's Quarterly. That's what I still call it. Let me thank our recording engineer here at NPR in New York, Neil Rauch. The show is edited in Los Angeles by our associate producer, Blake White. The show is mixed in Los Angeles by Cat York. I'm going to go and buy some new clothes. It's the treatment. To catch up on past episodes of The Treatment, go to kcrw.com or listen on your smartphone with KCRW's mobile apps or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or if you listen to podcasts. The Treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. That don't